For today's video, I'm going to be going over how fish waste can be used as a natural fertiliser in low-tech planted aquariums. This is the method that I use in all but one of my aquariums right now and it removes the need to rely on liquid fertilisers or root tabs. Just keep in mind that this approach may not be ideal for high-tech setups which use CO2 injection and high-powered lighting since that will cause your plants to grow at a faster pace, but for low-tech tanks like mine this is perfectly fine. So I want to start by going over what's actually in fish poop and as long as you're feeding your fish a nutrient-rich diet to support their health, their waste can provide plenty of nutrients to fuel plant growth in low-tech tanks. But this is not just about solid waste, as some sources suggest that fish can release up to 90% of the ammonia they produce as liquid waste through their gills. Both the liquid and solid waste from the fish work together and they contain valuable nutrients such as nitrogen compounds, phosphorus, potassium and various essential trace elements. Out of the three macronutrients that plants require, nitrogen and phosphorus are usually abundant when using this natural fertilisation method in your own planted tanks. However, potassium can sometimes run a little low and, depending on your specific setup, you may also see deficiencies in bioavailable iron and magnesium. But, in a capped dirt setup with rooted plants that can absorb nutrients directly via their roots if needed, this really shouldn't be a major issue. So moving on and we get to what we should actually feed our fish to make sure their waste contains as many useful nutrients as possible. In short, I personally try to choose foods which list whole, recognisable ingredients like named animal or plant sources as their primary and ideally secondary ingredients. Further down the ingredients list, I also look for support and nutrient sources from animal and plant sources that I can easily recognise to boost the nutritional profile of the food without having to go off and Google what does it different codes and chemicals mean. If you're a regular viewer of my channel, you may already know I'm a big fan of both the Fluval and Hakari fish food ranges. I leave links in the description to some of my favourite products from both brands that have worked very well with this type of fertilisation in my own tanks. But there's one more important factor to consider and that's digestibility which means how much of a given nutrient actually stays in the fish and how much actually ends up in their waste. For example, if a potassium source has 100% digestibility with a specific species of fish, that fish will absorb all of the potassium in their food. But if only 50% of it is digestible, half of it will end up in the fish and the other half becomes plant nutrients. Digestibility doesn't just vary between different nutrient types either, it also changes depending on the actual source of that nutrient and the species of fish you are feeding. Phosphorus is a great example of this because it can come from animal bones, plants, organic compounds and inorganic sources and each of these have their own digestibility rating even if they are fed to the exact same fish. Another factor is the different natural diets that fish have evolved to live on such as being a carnivore, omnivore or herbivore and this can add another factor to it but the majority of my fish are omnivores so most fish foods on the market work perfectly fine. Now in most cases, this variation in digestibility shouldn't be a major issue and most aquatic plants should easily get what they need regardless. But there is one specific situation where this may become a problem in your tank when using this method. For instance, I was consistently running into potassium deficiencies in my java fern because they are epiphyte plants grown on driftwood or rocks, rather than being rooted plants which can draw nutrients from the substrate if needed. Although it's hard to confirm, I do personally think java fern do require higher than average potassium too, but there was a way that I could fix this naturally. After consistently seeing tiny pinholes in my java fern leaves for months, I did start reaching out for help and my friend's dad mentioned how he will add high potassium foods to his tank to try and counter this. So I decided to start feeding my own shrimp and snails foods which are higher in potassium to try and fix the problem and thankfully it does seem to have worked. All of the new leaves on my java fern in my 40 gallon tank are healthy and aren't shown any tiny pinholes in them. 
And just in case you're curious, I regularly feed both my shrimp and snails spinach, oak leaves, mulberry leaves and dandelion leaves, which are all naturally high in potassium and absolutely loved by my invertebrates. Just a quick note for these leaves though, because they do contain oxalic acid, which can prevent shrimp from uptaking other essential nutrients. However, to my knowledge, blanching them before use will drastically reduce the amount of oxalic acid in all of those food types, making them far safer to use with your shrimp. Moving on, and we get to the role of microorganisms in this process, and this is a key area that I consistently see people making mistakes with. Now I've read a few different scientific papers on this topic and to be honest, most of them get technical and confusing very quickly. But I did recently find this article from a PhD student in a university over in Canada that explains everything in a really clear, easy to understand way and I'll link it in the description if you want to check it out. The article also touches on some interesting side topics like why bad smells can often be associated with anoxic conditions like those used in father fish style tanks due to excessive methane production. In contrast, it also touches on how in aerobic, oxygen rich conditions like those used in a Wallstad method tank, unpleasant odours are rare and shouldn't be an issue. But getting back to the microorganisms and the short version is, this is a team effort with a lot of different things playing their role in the tank. While the article I mentioned earlier does mainly focus on aquaponics, it does highlight creatures like rotifers and various other microscopic little animals doing the heavy lifting, but many of these same principles can be applied to our aquariums. In the type of aquariums I personally keep, I do intentionally try to cultivate non-pathogenic waste-eating bacteria strains, which is surprisingly easy because they are commonly found in drinking water in small amounts, it's just a case of building that colony up over time. These bacteria help break down organic matter like leftover fish food, fish waste and decaying plant leaves and remineralize a lot of the nutrients into the water column. On top of that, they can also act as a natural source of CO2 for our aquarium plants to help them get some CO2 in a submerged environment too. But the most common problem I see with this type of fertilization is from the broader aquarium hobby where they consistently have to do water changes and gravel vac their substrates to keep their tanks clean. Consistent gravel vacuuming often strips away a lot of the organic detritus that these waste eating bacteria colonies need to feed on to build up their colony size so they can actually be useful for this process. I don't gravel vac any of my aquariums and in the video footage you can see how clean the substrate is, there isn't a consistent buildup of moam or detritus or anything like that because the waste eating bacteria colonies and the microscopic organisms break it all down to be used as nutrients by the plants in my tanks. So in summary, after our fish, shrimp and snails produce waste, there's a small army of tiny microorganisms which are invisible to the naked eye that break it all down in different stages and release water-soluble nutrients for the plants to use. The non-water-soluble nutrients often become mulm and can settle into the substrate and offer some remineralization for the roots to use as nutrients too. So moving on and I want to talk about how aquarium plants actually use the nutrients derived from the fish waste for nutrients as there's a lot of misconceptions about this too. Unfortunately, the vast majority of available research we have on plant nutrient uptake is from the agriculture industry where the primary focus is root uptake from soil. However, foliar feeding where nutrient solutions are sprayed directly onto the leaves of terrestrial plants is gaining traction, especially for treating micronutrient deficiencies in certain plant species. This is because multiple research papers have found that plants, even in their immersed out of water form, can still absorb nutrients through their stoma and cuticles on their leaf surfaces. Unfortunately though, there's really not that much research specific to how plants in their submerged aquatic form take up nutrients, but there does seem to be a larger push into optimizing this because of the hobby gain and traction. But there is an increased understanding on how aquatic plants can absorb a surprisingly large amount of nutrients directly from the water column of the aquarium through their leaves and stems. This ability is specifically strong in the types of plants we typically keep in our aquariums which are hydrophytes or also known as marsh plants or amphibious plants. 
This is because these plants have both an immersed out of water form and a submerged underwater form and they undergo some drastic changes when they convert between the two. The most obvious and noticeable change in a lot of these plant species is the shape and colour of their leaves but something even more important does start to happen. When submerged, a lot of these plants drastically reduce or completely stop producing stoma pores and cuticles on their leaves, changing how they do nutrient uptake. In their immersed forms, both the stoma pores and the cuticle layer are vital for things like CO2 exchange, water retention and nutrient uptake. But underwater, these structures on the plant leaves become unnecessary and a waste of energy for the plants to maintain so they stop producing them. This is because when submerged, the plant is surrounded by water, so moisture is no longer a major limiting factor of nutrient uptake like it is on land. Even better because our fish, shrimp and snails produce waste in our aquariums which is then broken down by the microorganisms I mentioned earlier, releasing a lot of water soluble nutrients into the water, our aquarium plants can absorb a lot of what they need naturally through their leaves and stems. Now the root uptake of nutrients in the plant's submerged aquatic forms can still occur but in my opinion it's nowhere near as important as once thought. As I mentioned earlier, the non-water soluble nutrients essentially ends up as mulm which can penetrate into the substrate over time and offer a nutrient source for the plant roots when it comes into contact with it. But on top of that there's also the cation exchange capacity of various soils which lets them absorb various nutrient ions from the water column of our aquariums and store them in the substrate for root uptake by the plants if needed. Anyway guys, that brings the video to an end. I hope it's been helpful and using fish waste as a fertilisation method in my own tanks has consistently worked well across many, many setups and it's removed the need for expensive liquid fertilisers and root tabs, so I hope it works well for you too.